Brother David, what you guys got going on today anyways? Just busy. Where are y'all working at? We got a couple of projects going on. We're out on 27 right here building an aerial line in. I got some guys over in Cartersville putting in some underground, and we're back up in Somerville building an underground circuit around to uh, make a ring uh, back from Rome to Somerville to make some more fiber redundancy. That's what it's all about for us. Huh. And now, uh, do, is this – contracted through through the state or how does that work because you're supplying basically high speed internet to areas that don't have it is that right that's correct so no it's it's we have there's really two companies well there's really three companies there's a holding company that owns all the companies but then there's parker fibernet which is a selec and a other common carrier. So that's where we get our certificated authority. That's how we get access to public rights of ways. So we're, in 1996, through the Telecom Act, Congress enacted a, an act so that small local companies can compete with large companies. And so the large company in this area that you would know is AT&T. Yeah. So AT&T is what we call an ILEC. They're an incumbent local exchange carrier. And then the Telecom Act made a provision for what's called a CLEC, a competitive local exchange carrier. And then there's other common carriers for interstate and FCC regulations and a bunch of nonsense. But anyway, we're a CLEC. So that gives us the same authority that the ILEC has. But we can go after competitive circuits for like one business or two businesses or three rather than having to serve the whole community as the ILEC is mandated to do. Now, the ILEC has some other you know benefits because they they have to serve everybody in the community we only have to serve the people we want to do competitively so we become like an option so that's what we did so we got our authority back in 1999 okay and so we've been doing it ever since and in georgia alabama and tennessee we probably have about 3,000 route miles of fiber so those projects that i was talking about or an extension or a continuation of that so we wow. have a we have a big ring that goes from Chattanooga to Atlanta, on into Athens. It goes in toward Anniston on in Alabama. It's it's built a combination of places, mainly in public rights of ways along highways. Mm -hmm. And then we have bought some fiber. They're called IRUs, indefensible rights of use, indefeasible rights of use. Big fancy attorney talk, <laughs> you know. Get some of them Trapman and Sander boys down there in Atlanta, and you charge you way too much money, but. So we, we get our authority from those guys, from the Public Service Commission. So we're regulated just like AT&T or some of those guys are. No kidding. And that's what we do. So then we get our authority to do that. And then when we get a business edge or a, we see a customer, an opportunity, then we use that to go um, get the right away from the state. In this case, if it's a state DOT or the local municipality. And we do that through a franchise fees. So like in Rome or Somerville or smaller towns, you know, we pay a franchise fee, which is a tax to the citizenry for us to be back in their space. So if you buy a circuit from me and I a hundred dollars and we collect 3% of it and then we give it back to the city. And that's how we get the, the access to the right of way of the city. Huh. So, so that's how we get our access for the, for the different companies we do. Man, that's some complex stuff right there, buddy. Yeah. That's well. big, that's big <laughs> deals. Yeah. Oh, let me introduce David Parker real quick. Welcome to the 307 podcast, by the way. Um, this is David Parker and this is how I met David. Uh, so we live on a pretty, on a pretty remote farm, uh, north of town and there is no internet at all remote is a, is a, you should explain remote because you know some people think remote means that you like drive out of town you you go to the edge of the earth turn left go five miles and then you go 10 more miles and turn right <laughs> yeah. that's, that's remote we, yeah that's a, so that that's a good description of where we live and so we're we're out here and, and you know to ha to not have internet is a blessing and a curse because I think people say, oh, that sounds great. You know, you don't have to, you get home, you don't have to worry about emails and, 
and the call and calls and this and that. And I say, well, yeah, it is sometimes a blessing uh, because you don't have to worry about that stuff. But uh, the fact of the matter is, the way the world works and the way our business operates, we have to have internet. Yeah. So you know, Brooke starts uh, exploring the options of internet, and there is obviously satellite internet which absolutely is worthless in my opinion all right well, but let's it's, it's a technology problem it's not worthless it's it's a technology problem so it's a thirty-one thousand mile geosync orbit that's 0. 0.8 tenths of a second the propagation of electromagnetic energy through space that's one way to the satellite and then it's one way back so when you click on your mouse to go to do a Google search or, you know, some people might go look up Miss January or whatever it is they're looking for, right? It It's 0.8 seconds up and 0.8 seconds. So it, it seems slow. A second seems fast, but a second slow if you click. Because yeah. when we click on the Internet, we want something to happen. Yeah. So you just have to understand satellite's terrible because of the delay. And there's no way around the delay, right? Now, you boy, Elon Musk, he's going to put in some low-orbit satellites. Mm-hmm. So, so it we shortens get rid the delay. It shortens the delay, but the problem is, is the technology has to be really good because he's got like forty nine thousand of these satellites zipping around at two or three hundred miles. So the delay's gone, but the handoff time is only like horizon to horizon. So I don't know, ten minutes, seven minutes, five, whatever it was. Iridium had a similar time. So then they don't hand off good, and so then you then you just get lost. So if you go and you want to download a big file to work on it off the satellite, it could work. You could get a Netflix movie, but if you're trying to work, it's absolutely terrible. It's not terrible because of the technology. It's terrible because of the physics. That's right. Yep. Yep. I, I didn't yep. mean to interrupt. No, that, and that's been my experience. We tried that and, uh, it's like, it, it just, it just didn't work for us with the zoom calls and all the stuff that yeah, happens. The online. Latency is, yeah. You're it's done happen by the time you're doing it. That's right. Or play a video game. If you play a first person game, you walk into the room, everybody's done, shot everybody, talked to everybody, and then you're leaving. That's it. Yeah. And, then, and then you're like, oh, look, look how good I got shot. <laughs> <laughs> because you just walk in and don't do anything, right? That's it. So Brooke's looking for, for options, and like, we're, we, we don't know what we're going to do. And then here's this one man named David Parker. <laughs> There's only one. He's the only one that's like, Oh yeah, we could get we could get high speed internet up in here, easy day, and like I I remember thinking, there's no way, like there's no way this guy can actually do this. It's just I, money. I, I I don't I don't comprehend what even what he did. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to talk to David here in a minute about uh how he got going in this industry and how look. When I watch David come out and bring us high speed internet, which takes us to the next level, it's 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 a necessary part of life nowadays. He's the only man that could do it. But what impressed me was um, every piece of equipment that he brought out there. This is big equipment, by the way, big trucks, uh, large uh, spider monkey looking tractors that I've never seen in my life. Every piece of equipment David brought out that's part of uh, Parker Fibernet was clean as a pin, son. I mean, this stuff looked sharp. His men were sharp. They they carried themselves well. They spoke well. They got the work done. And I was like, man, that that's that's legit. Yeah. Um. And so you know, it was amazing what you were able to do, David. And going back, you know. Where did you where did you come from? How did you grow up? Well, I, I grew up. We were just talking about it. You know, we we live out in the middle of the country. I knew how to describe where you live because that's where I live. Yeah, I grew up on a farm. I went to Chattooga High School, which is just a you know a poor community. I mean, Chattooga County in Georgia. I think there's 180 some counties in Georgia. I, don't quote me. It's somewhere in that number. I think we're like if we're not sixth or seventh from the bottom, we're fifth. I mean, we're, we're the worst one, 20, 20 some thousand people. I grew up there and, uh, worked on a farm. We had 30,000 chickens, had to pick up eggs, had 150 old cows. And, um, I always kind of had an aptitude for electrical stuff when I was in high school. I, I was a kid that put in car stereos. 
I put in, you know, multiple amps, electronic crossovers before it was cool. You know, people, yeah. people do that now, but I was doing that in 1980. And, um, then people started having contests and, you know, I met some folks that had a lot of money and we'd put, I put systems in their cars that would bounce a quarter off the top of the roof. I mean, it was, you know, cause I knew I understood power, I understood amps, you know, mm. audio, that kind of stuff. So then I went to Georgia tech, got a degree in electrical engineering. And then I just, I've never worked for anybody. I've always worked for myself. And, um, while I was at tech, two guys ahead of me graduated started a small alarm company we do cameras access control those kind of things uh security systems um a few years back maybe the 90s there was a bunch of uh, guys got shot up in courtrooms uh people would come in and all the other courts got nervous about it so we put in a fiber optic camera system for the lookout mountain judicial circuit and i did Armatech's, the uh, benches. I mean, I just do anything, you know, I just hustling, you know. And uh, so we built that system out. Well, then the people that found out that we were doing fiber in mills, you know, because you can only run back then, if you was doing video cameras, you had to do it like on a coax, 59, 75 ohm stuff, and have to extend it a long way. Well, we got good at running bigger cable, coax, RG11, and other sizes to extend that. Well, then we figured out fiber that we could run the cameras a long way and started building camera systems in between municipal buildings. And then that led us into the fiber business to the computers because people says, well, if you can do the fiber for this, can you do it for our computers? And then the computer world got me into um, doing servers in Novell. I don't know if you remember Novell and networking, so that took me into that. Um, About that time, a buddy of mine had a bank and computers were getting smaller, and so banks started processing in-house. They started clearing their own cash letter in-house rather than going to a big brokered bank. You know, like SunTrust used to clear all the community banks, and then they started doing their own cash letter and going to the Fed and doing that. So that we started doing computer systems for that. Well, about that time, I decided that um, there was a real – in our area, there wasn't a good connection from Atlanta to Chattanooga in fiber, so I wanted to get – started looking at thinking about maybe building fiber in the public rights of way because I had found businesses that had maybe their implant over here and their office over here and they wanted to connect it. So, you know, usually those were big influential people in the community. So they could, I could go to them and negotiate private right away or public right away just because they were such a large employer. And so then I go, well, I need to get this. So, you know, the internet wasn't a thing really back then. Yeah. And so I built my own browser sitting in the basement Library of Congress reading about how to become a CLEC or that this telecom act was coming out. And so I started that, knew that I couldn't fight with Georgia Power because it, initially I was going to attach to their polls, found out that their attorney was Troutman and Sanders, found out that Troutman and Sanders was in bed with the Public Service Commission in Georgia, and I'm like, that's who I need to have. And so this banking world, this computer world, took me into the banking world. I was poor. Want to take him good vacations and and deduct them. So I joined community bankers. So that they took nice vacations. You know, on a cause of a, a um, like they go to a conference, but it'd yeah. be in like Jekyll Island or in Hawaii or wherever. So if I went, I could deduct that because I was a community banker. Well, I found out a guy that was in community bankers that was at Trapman and Sanders, and I got an audience with him. And uh, when he sat in with the telecom guru for them. He goes, well, this sounds like a good idea. And so I pre-sold him service in Athens, and that's how I got started. I built my first fiber ring in Athens, connecting his bank together, and pre-sold him service for 10 years, got my first little bit of money to go build the ring, and then I just kept building rings and expanding, go find a customer, sell them the deal, you know, hustle. Yeah. Um, And I grew up doing that. I mean, you know, when I first started – you know, it's a little different now, but, you know, if I had $100, I'd push 200 into the middle of the table, and if it all didn't go right, I'd have been broke. But I'd do that every day, over and over again, you know, just <laughs> hustling. You know, I had 11 employees, and I needed, you know, I could have really afforded five. If anything had went wrong, I just was all in, all in, all in, you know. And then Wow, I, man. And then I finally just got, you know, and I have to be careful to give God the credit. I didn't, I didn't ask y'all about where you are on your podcast. And, you know, I know people have different things about that. So, 
uh, you know, I'm intentionally Christian, but, you know, I don't push what I do on other people. You know, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to explain that God's been good to me, but, you know, whatever you look for, karma, the universe, whatever, I well, believe in God. Yeah, well, we believe, yeah, we believe in God here too. Yeah. Well, I didn't know. I mean, you know, some people, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm intentional about that, but, you know, I, I have to give him the credit for the success that I've had. But, man, when I first started, if one thing went wrong, man, I'd hustle. I'd just go all, all in. And so I just kept going all in, you know, and build more fiber and get more here. And then, you know, I still have my little arm business and doing that. But I just kept, you know, building and growing. And then finally you get so many employees, though. You know, I'm up to about 45 employees. You have to then realize, hey, i got 45 families I'm responsible yeah. for. You know, so now, I, you know, they, they, it's fun when you're whatever, but, you know, now, now I have to make good business decisions. You know, our, our reoccurring revenue base, our, our world's kind of caught up to us. So we, we make more intentional decisions now. You know, we're, you know, we, we look at where our costs are, where, where our cash flow is, and, and we cover our reoccurring revenue covers all of our expansion. So, you know, we don't, like right now, I could have, if, if it was back in the 11 people day or the five people day or I was hustling, I'd have 150 employees right now, you know, cause yeah, I, I yeah. could, I could make it, but everything would have to happen. Right. You know, and then, you know, that's fun, but it ain't. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I love that mindset, man. And I'll tell you what, that you're talking about risk. Yeah. You're talking yeah. about risk is what you're talking about. You're talking about, like David just said, I've never heard it put that way. I absolutely love that. If I only had a hundred dollars to play with, I'd push hundred two hundred dollars to the center of the table. And by taking that risk, now you are where you are today. Highly, highly successful businessman. You know, and I want to go back to that statement you made, you know, when you got when you got done with Georgia Tech, first of all, that's a big shift in culture. From Chattooga County to Georgia Tech, oh, yeah. I can guarantee you there's not many old boys from from Chattooga County that wind up in Georgia Tech. Um, you know what led what led you there? Was it just was it the passion? Did you did you have a vision? I well, mean, my, that's well, a hard dad, school, man. Yeah, my dad. It, it, you know, I give him the credit for that. So, and I, I'm a little bit weird too. You know, I was born in Germany. I was adopted there. My dad was in the military. Him and mom had tried to get pregnant for 11, 12 years. Couldn't make it happen. And then they adopted me in Germany, which is un, kind of unusual. And, um, you know, I don't know the case, but it's, but I suspect that my birth mom, you know, got pregnant one cool 54 years ago to be pregnant and maybe from a family of means. So she went to Europe to study for a year, popped me out, you know, adopted me away, and then mom and dad got me. But dad always taught me to do, hey, son, it don't matter what you're going to do. If you're going to be the garbage guy, you'll be the best one there was. If you're going to dig a ditch, dig the ditch the best. If you're going to pick up eggs, pick them up, you know, figure out a thing, you know, be intentional, be the best that you can be. <clears throat> and I had a little aptitude for electronics. I did pretty good in math. I'm, You know, I did real good on the SAT, you know, um, made 800 on the math side, which back in the day, that's all you can make. Made 440 on the verbal. Found out I was dyslexic. <laughs> I tell people I'm dyslexic and stupid, and they cancel out. But when I mess up, <laughs> it gets just to be a disaster. <laughs> so, I heard that, bro. Yeah, so I appear normal because I'm dyslexic, and my stupidity cancels it out. So I appear normal <laughs> to most people. I have a little aptitude on the math side. But uh, so anyway, so Dad had always put that in me, so I always knew I wanted to be an engineer. I always knew I wanted to go to tech. And, and really what that did, Georgia Tech just gave me – I can remember um, I was the youngest person to pass a low voltage test uh, in in Georgia. Max Cleland at the time wrote me a personal letter with a felt temp blue pen. Thought that was kind of neat, but um, you know, it, it's, and I walked in. I had to, and you had to go to the board in, in in downtown Atlanta to to take this test. And one of the guys up there says, "Well, you're awful young. You know what makes it." think that you can run a successful business being a low voltage contractor doing alarm systems and as such. I said, well, I went to Georgia tech and the guy's like, oh, okay. You know, so that's yeah. what I learned the, just that, you know, it's like my dad always says, college don't teach you anything. College teaches you how to learn. 
college teaches you how to, you know, get along in this world and, and to re- react and interact with people and teaches you to pay a little rent and, you know, have your own apartment and pay the power bill and sort of, it's sort of like a quick life lesson. Yep. Right? Yep. That's what college teaches you. And so, but, but tech, it, it taught me, it gave me credibility. That's right. You know, so when I walked in at that, at, at that age, I've, I've done a lot of things now. I just now have got kind of to the age that people expect me to be where I'm at. You know, I was always like that kid that was super, I was doing alarm systems for people's houses when I was 16, mm-hmm. 15 years old, you know, maybe driving when I shouldn't have been at 15 to go put an alarm system in. And back then alarm system was three or $4,000. So I had to, I had to talk to you and say, Hey, don't get this company out of Atlanta. Cause alarm systems in Somerville, Georgia, Chattooga County, 1985, 1990 was there's probably 10. Yeah. And it was a commodity. They were in million dollar houses or $500,000 houses in Somerville, the nicest houses and nicest people. And at 16, I had to convince those people that, Hey, I'm responsible. You know, not only am I 16, most people are like chasing girls and driving fast and whatever, you know, but you know, that was one of the commitments. Like my dad, he grew up, his father died when he was 12 years old of appendicitis. His mother was killed in a car wreck. He was driving when he was 15 he never drank anything. So dad came to me and said, you know, Hey, I don't drink. I really wish you wouldn't drink, but if you do, I'll do it with you. And so I could tell people when I was trying to sell them, like, look, I'm not out drinking or carousing. I'm 16. And then I could never really drink because if their alarm broke, I can't, you know, they let me do it. I'm 16, 18, 20 years old. And they call me up and they say, Hey, my alarm's broke. I go, man, I love to come see you, but I'm, I'm tore up. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. like watching Pink Floyd and smoking dope, you know? I think you ain't going to be successful. You had you know? some, you had some extreme accountability early on in life. Right. Yeah. That's, right. Man, that's awesome. And I love that lesson your dad instilled in you, man. That's what I try to get people to get this all the time, David, exactly what your dad taught you. If you're going to embark on something, on some mission, your goal should be to be the best in the world. That's right. That that should be your goal, and you're not always going to hit that. You're you're not always going to hit it, but that should always be in the forefront of your mind. I want to be the best in the world, and now it takes a long time to get there. Um, it's a process, but that should always be at the forefront of your mind. I love that, man. If you're going to do anything, there's a book about ten thousand hours. You know, that's a hard lesson I had to learn too, because. This is going to come across as arrogant, but it's not intended to be. I don't meet too many people that I think that are smarter than I am. Yeah. And I shouldn't say it like that, but that's just, that's just, I believe that. Mm -hmm. So when I go to Troutman and Sanders and, and I'm broke, I mean, I am worth like $50,000 and that's if I sell everything and my dad gives me my inheritance, I'm broke. And the attorney's 700 an hour, $700 an hour. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, and I'm faking until I make it and, you know, I probably have three grand in the bank and I'm sitting there talking to him for seven hours and I win 4,900 bucks. <laughs> It'll get your attention. Right. But mm. you know, it, it's just, that, you know, like you said, if you're, if you're going to be good at something, so it's hard for me to pay somebody $700 an hour that I think I'm smarter than they are. Yeah. But they have 10,000 hours of experience, you know? Yeah, I think you mentioned you were a Navy SEAL. You know, if you don't think you're the best, if you don't think that you're going to run up against your adversary and they're going to kill you, then what are you doing? That's it. It gives you a just the just the belief that you are the best, or you at least you can be the best, or I can compete at this level That's where it. this other guy's not going to get me. That's it. It puts you at because if you don't go into there, and and if the military doesn't give you that training, and you don't believe in your brother and the man next to yeah. you and your training and the gear, and you know you talk about our equipment. That's the same way. I want my guys to have the best stuff. I want them to do it right. You know. Yeah. I mean, and we don't always do it right. We yeah. we still hit stuff. We still mess up, but. I want to try to be the best, like you said. Yep. And so and so I, then I had to learn that maybe this guy ain't as smart as me, but he's got more experience. Mm. And so I'm going to need that, right? And it, and it, that's a hard lesson to learn. And and I learned great lessons from those guys. I was – so be, becoming the first C-Lec, you know, happened in 96. You know, the guy in Athens, the, the city manager in Athens, he doesn't know what a C-Lec is. He doesn't know that, hey, this guy can come in and he gets the same – we got to treat him the same as AT&T. You know, that's a foreign concept to them at that time. 
And they kind of jerked me around. Well, I knew I was right. So I dragged my high dollar attorney down in there. We go into that meeting. And I'm going to win. I know I'm going to win. And, and I win. And, man, and, and I win good. I've got this guy, not literally, but I've got, I'm jumping up and down on him. I'm beating the crap out of him. My attorney's kicking me under the table. I'm looking at him like, I'm winning right now. You just sit over there. <laughs> my attorney, he drags me out of that room. He says, what are you doing? I said, dude, he cost me this much money, this much time, blah, blah, blah. I said, I brought you down here. He goes, David, when you win, win. Win with grace. You know, it ain't going to help you to beat him up. Mm. You know, you, you you got what you wanted. You're still going to have to work with him. He's pissed off at you because you were right. But but he, he didn't mean to cause you all this harm, you know. So wow. you, you have to learn, you know. Yeah, right? yeah. And just like just like you do when when y'all go in, you could have the cavalry come in and bomb the crap out of the place, or carpet bomb this, or do that. But if you use your intelligence and you were stealth and you went in and you and you surgically did something, yeah, yeah. you don't have to kill everybody. You you just need to cut their finger off. That's right. Not let that's them right. bleed out. You know, you just accomplish the goal. Yep, man. Yeah, and it taught me that. You know, that's solid, brother. And and you know, as you went through that, David, kind of what I heard is. That, that's the difference. That's not an arrogant statement. That is a confident statement. That's yeah. confidence. There's a there's a difference between confidence and arrogance, right? Confidence is a necessary ingredient to be the best in, in the world at whatever you decide to do. And, or think you are. Or, or, yeah, or think you or are. Or know that you've done all you can that's do. That's right. And, and so don't confuse those two. They can sound a lot alike sometimes, right? But that confidence is a necessary ingredient. Arrogance is a is a dangerous attribute if you if you are arrogant. But know the difference between the two. I think David explained that very well. And you know when you get out of when you get out of school, David. I you know you said I, I never worked for anybody, so I just went ahead and started my own thing. But I can only imagine with your knowledge, uh, your you know level of intelligence. It, it, was it ever tempting to to go to AT&T or to some other company and go that route? I mean, that's obviously the easier route. Were you ever tempted by those options? or? Well, you know, like I said, God's been good to me. And and, and now with, with the network that we have built, it's, it's, very, um, it's very gratifying for the offers and some of the things that we get to buy our company. Um, in there in the middle of that, um, the Atlanta Olympics came to Atlanta. And Gary McConnell, he he had a lot of confidence in me. He was a sheriff in Chattooga County and went on to be the director of GEMA. At the time, GEMA was maybe 10 or 15 people, and Gary made it a, a statewide more of a presence and started taking some of the money that the governor would, would have put out, and he made, it a, he made it a really big thing and a good thing for Georgia. Well, during GEMA, they created SOLEC, State Olympic Law Enforcement Command, and we got to build the war room out. The, the room used to be maybe seat 10 people, and then it went to seating 400 people. It was a smart concept. So they got a representative from the state troopers in there and the fire department and the DOT. And so any of the state resources, they could just look across a table in yeah. a room, and you, you've got the decision makers in there. It. Well, we built a TV system, and we built the the back end of the Atlanta Olympic uh, thing, and we would help with, like, when they would activate for Freak Nick or different kinds of events that came to Atlanta. So we got involved in that. Well, Motorola was there putting in the radio system, and then that led us into doing encrypted force protection radio systems for Motorola all over the world. So we got to do that kind of work, and we charged a lot of money for that. I mean, we went to road to Spain and Italy and Germany, and they tried to get us to go to, like, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I finally told them people, I said, I ain't working for none of the stands. (laughs) (laughs) Pakistan and all that, you know. You probably have some experience in the military going to those places. I wasn't in the military, and, you know, we, we've been on a lot of military bases. I've been probably on 100 military bases. Matter of fact, I got put on the do-not-fly list because I was leaving Atlanta, flying to international cities that had air bases. And I'm like, I'm working for y'all, and you put me on this list. <laughs> so I got a little bit of that just because I was doing that consulting and that contracting work at that level. But yeah. I, I never, I never missed not working for myself. I don't, you know. Again, I think I would have had a problem. I mean, I'm good at working for people. I have 
all the customers I have, if they're a $500 a month customer or a $5,000 a month customer, I feel like that they're my boss, but I've never, I've never been good. Anybody that I would have worked for, I probably would have thought, well, I could probably do their job better than they could mm-hmm. or, or would have had a problem with that. So I, I like being logistically in charge of what I'm doing yeah, yeah. in my time. Um, and you're still heavily, heavily involved in Parker Fibernet. That's what really surprised me, man, was seeing seeing your face. I mean, you're you're the main you're you're the dude. I mean, yeah. you're you're the top dog. And, and even this small project at at our place, it was like you were there. I mean, you've been in my living room mm. doing doing stuff, man. Right. And I'm like, so why have you stayed so involved in it? Well, I'd like to be more involved. I mean. You know, like growing up on a farm, one of the neat things about doing it is, you know, if you plow a 20-acre field, there's nothing like at the end of the day, you know, like that field was ratty and bushes and weeds and you get done and you've plowed it and it's smooth and you just, the, the tractor and the smell of the diesel and the heat of the engine and you, you're you done and you see 20 acres, it looked perfect. Yep. Or you mowed grass or you, you've done hay or you've baled hay and it looks perfect. You know, there, there's some, there's a reward to that. You know, in our business, you know, you ride around all day, talk on the phone, you don't get anything done. So when my guys are out working, you know, I like to be in the ditch. I like to run the equipment. You know, I can still do everything in my company, not well, because I don't do it 10,000 hours. Mm-hmm. I got guys that splice fiber. I still can do that. You know, I when we first started, I was in the router classes, you know, but, you know, now I've got guys that are so much better and all that than I am. But, you know, I know a little bit. You have a basic understanding. But, of, but yeah. you know, but you just don't have time to be good at it if that's not what yeah. you do all the time. But, yeah, I stay I stay hands-on. I like I like for the guys to see me. Um, you know, my two boys have graduated from Auburn, and uh, they want to come back into business. And people think that I've pushed them into that. Well, I really haven't. I, one of them actually went and worked for a great big, huge contractor for as an internship. And the other one, that's just what they've known they, they've wanted to do. When And my kids, when they were out of school – you know, I grew up having to pick up eggs. You know, I didn't do it many times, but 30,000 eggs I've picked up by myself. That's eight hours. That's all you're doing is picking up eggs in a chicken house, pushing a cart up and down. We didn't have anything automated. My dad did it many, many days by himself, plus do the feeding, plus do that. 12, 14 hours, just one man, just solid at it. And uh, But he but he was his own boss. You know, he got, yeah. to, he got to do that, and, and that's what I learned. Yeah. I learned I didn't want to be in a chicken house. You know, and when you're sitting at tech and, you know, and I want the best student, you know, I was, I had two guys that I had hired ahead of me. I was kind of consultant. I mean, they call it co-op if you do it formally, but I take a quarter off, quarter off here. You know, I get thrown out because I wouldn't make the right grade and then go back. So, and technically I never finished. I like three technical electives and one English <laughs> to finish at tech. But, uh, and, and, and so uh, I got all my engineering classes out of the way, but, um, yeah, that was, that was one thing that was a little, um, and, and I was just working, you know? Yep. Yep. And this is, uh, this, this these kind of lessons here re- really resonate with me. You say, I know I didn't want to be in a chicken house and, you know, uh, <laughs> this resonates with me because I can remember getting my butt handed to me on, on the beach in Southern California during basic underwater demolition seal training and looking out and seeing one of them big Navy ships, hazed gray and underway, son, and just knowing them souls out there were having a, a rough go at it. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be out on one of those big Navy <laughs> ships. So I'm going to stay right here yeah. where I'm at, getting my butt handed to me on the beach, man. And you talk about knowing every, at least having a basic understanding of every component of your business that's the way a SEAL platoon operates. Yeah. I was a breacher in the SEAL teams. I had to be the expert at breaching. But I also had to have a basic understanding of how to take a 1,000-yard shot. I had to have a basic understanding of how to operate my embitter, my little personal radio. I had to have a basic understanding of medical procedures. Yeah. You, have to, you have to operate that way. And even now in 307 Project, if we need to edit this video because our video editor gets sick for a month, we can do that. If we need to edit this audio file, we can do that. We have all have a basic understanding of every aspect of the things that need to happen to make this 
thing go. Yeah, I and, saw you clap at the beginning. You were syncing your audio and your, that's it, your video. Man. Just you know, you you learn that because you're like, oh dang, let me search through here for ten hours to find something so I can get it synced back up. <laughs> that's it, man. But yeah, and, but but you learn that. That's it. And just like in the seals, though, I mean, you guys, I've watched those things on the on the beach, and and it and it is always. You know, the, in the movies, they portray it as these six six big dudes. The guys that make it through SEALs are the guy that's, like, like wiry and, like, um, they're usually, what, 5'10"? Yeah, yeah. Just pure muscle. 150 pounds. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. can go. And their tenacity to overcome pain and um, their tenacity to overcome discomfort and still perform and make good decisions. Uh, I've seen videos where they're training pilots. And they give them a cognitive test and they give them some simple task like playing Chinese checkers or something that's repeatable. And they, you know, say they can do that task in 20 minutes or 20 seconds. And then they come up and they do, uh, give them a, they get them cold, they get them wet, they sleep deprive them. And that 20 second task now all of a sudden takes two minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes. The SEALs are excellent at that. Mm -hmm. They, they, they train that, that out of you to where you're proficient when you're when you're hurt, when you're tired, when you're going, and then and then they build that camaraderie of trust among the, that operating team. It's it's an impressive thing. I'm actually worried. You know, we we won't delve too much off into politics, but you know, when I hear this nonsense on TV now of what they're trying to do to our military and 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 all this social justice engineering, you know, if, if something goes bad, the boys like you the folks that are on my crew that, you know, a redneck or a country boy, you know, you, you think about that song, a country boy can't survive, you know, and that there's a line in that song, you run a trot line, he can do this, he can do this, yeah. he can do this. You know, he can make it. We turn the power off in Atlanta for 48 hours. <sighs> Anarchy ensues because people don't know how to eat. People don't know how to do it. <laughs> I could eat. I don't like deer. I hate deer. But damn it, I could shoot a deer. You dang right. I could shoot him in the left eye with a seventeen. I could shoot him with a thirty out six. I could kill him with a twenty two. Hell, I could run over him with my F three fifty. You know, <laughs> I could field dress him enough to make it. I could build me a garden for next year, and I can make it. But, That's it, brother. But dude, eighty percent of the people in this state couldn't. Well, look at when we just we, we ran out we ran out of gas for a few days here about a month ago, and people were losing their minds, oh, yeah. son. Yeah, I, I thought and about predicted that. that happening. Yeah, when Joe Biden says, "Hey, we're going to turn off this and we're going to turn off this," you know, when, when Trump came up, we did the internet for the rally, and uh, and he paid us. I mean, they they paid us. It was just like a job. But I pulled one of them kids aside that was working for him, and I says, "He." And this was before the count, you know, the election. I said, Trump ain't saying anything about this energy independence. That is a huge deal. What Trump's done about making us energy independent from the rest of the world, because when COVID hit, just like clockwork, you can count on OPEC. You could count on those world, those countries that had the fuel to cut it down and curtail it to drive the price, and they did. And what it did is because their demand was up, and they had the production and running their refineries. Fuel went to free because it was cheaper than shutting down the thing because we had enough that they didn't drive the price on us. Gas would have been $5 during the middle of COVID with nobody using it because OPEC and those countries over there in the in the um, Middle East, they, they, they can be counted on to take advantage of a tragedy, to stick it to yeah. us and drive the uh. price, right? And they did that. And it, and it cost the fuel to go to zero because Trump had it. He filled up our strategic reserves. He put oil back in the ground huh. for us. But And then Biden says, well, I'm going to get rid of fossil fuels. I'm do this. Listen, economy drives renewable energy. Economy drives everything. Capitalism drives it. Yeah. If, you, if you want solar to work, make it cheaper. If you, it. Want, if you want diesel to work, if it's cheaper, it'll work. You know, when biodiesel worked, they put a dollar subsidy on it, and fuel was $4, $5. You, okay, so now it's four dollars and it's five. It's three and it's four. Biodiesel works. It don't work when it's a two dollars. Don't work when it's a dollar seventy. You know, and they're being dishonest about like the death trucks and all that. All the emissions gains came when they took the sulfur out of diesel fuel. It was a lubricant, just like they took lead out of gas. It's still in it for old airplanes, but they take lead and that out, and that's what cleaned it up. All this technology didn't clean it up. It's like two percent. Mm -hmm. 
taken the sulfur out, cleaned it up, and the, and the trucks run fine. Now they're using more fuel to make heat to burn up some of these different em- chemicals and elements in the combustion process. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, Trump, you know, he did that. Now I'm not all the way for Trump. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if if a weak Democratic president and a strong Republican Congress and a strong Republican House was the best thing for David Parker's business, that's what I'm for. But, you know, it sure is nice to have somebody that's intentionally for America. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we look around today, I couldn't figure it out for a second. I'm like, what's going on? Why, why would Biden want to sell us out? Why would these other folks, Zuckerberg, why would these people want to sell us out? And it, and then finally it struck me. It's just math. I'm dumb. In America, what is there, 380 million people? 340, 360, 320, depending on the immigration level. In Asia and China, there's 3 billion. 3 billion. Mm. So you look at Zuckerberg, that's Facebook. You look at Bezos, it's Amazon. That kid, I forget his name at Google, some Zogagaka is the name. And then you look at um, maybe even throw Dorsey in there with Twitter now. Those four men, personal net worth is about what the budget of America is. Now think Gosh about that. Gosh almighty, man. The companies, their companies are about what our GDP is, about $30 trillion a year, mm. $28 trillion, $26 trillion. Three to five trillion is what our budget ought to be. You know, they're spending way more than that, putting us in a deficit. That's their personal net worth. Those men sell to China and Asia. We're only ten percent of their business. Yeah. Yeah. If um we have a business of ten people and nine of the people come to you and say, Hey, don't sell to David anymore, he's ten percent. You're gonna screw David. And that's all they're doing. They're just businessmen. Zuckerberg, he's not for America. He's for Zuckerberg. Yeah. He's not for Facebook. He's for Facebook. And when China and India, I mean, he's got even more customers than $3 billion. But we're not even 10% of his business. Yeah. So that's why he's giving $300 million to shore up the Democratic folks because that's what Biden wants him to do. Mm-hmm. Because they'll continue to give him the power that he needs just like the Chinese continue to do it. So then it made sense. Yeah, yeah. And Trump didn't have any of that political capital. He didn't care. He was just for America, you know? <laughs> Dang, David, have you ever thought about running for politics, man? Yeah. Dude, we, we've got a huge problem in this country, and, you know. You've got a pretty dang good grasp on things, man. Uh, I don't know about that, but but what we got now, and, and listen, I like, I like some of the Republicans. I don't like some of them, but we've got career <clears throat> politicians. Yeah. The founders intended for – senators for example and, and you know they didn't even put in presidential term limits it was a, a, a gentleman's agreement yeah they didn't even think they needed to put them in right they didn't it wasn't until like the depression oh the mandate i stay in you know and it created the two-term president well that's a problem senators were intended to be successful businessmen in their community senators to make the laws then to give their experience that they had given in their community to govern the people next to them or to go to Congress for one term or two at the max to, to give their insight and their leadership yep. and then come home and help the people and make decisions not based on what was best for them personally, but what was best for their constituents. Yep. <clears throat> and if you're there for two terms, you do that. So, you know, senators are in for, what were they in six years? Give them two terms, that's 12 years, that's plenty of time. The House guys are in for two terms. Give them four, give them three, let them go six or eight years. I like Lindsey Graham, but he don't need to be there all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we basically have princesses and princesses and monarchs. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, you know, she had a personal net worth of three or four million dollars when she came in. Her net worth now is over 50 million. She makes 400,000 a year. That don't make no sense, does it? Speaker. I mean, what, you know, <laughs> they they just now put in some stuff where there's no such thing as insider trading, but a little bit for those guys, but they're making all the laws for the companies. <laughs> Pretty easy to know what company to invest in if you know that we're about to give Moderna a contract for 50 million doses or something at 10 bucks a dose, and, you know, their margin's 40%. Gee, I wonder if I should buy some Moderna. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, yeah, six so weeks before that. it comes out. But anyway, that that's a challenge we have. And it takes a constitutional convention, which means you got to get, what, 26 states, 27 states, depending on how you count it, to all come together to change the term limits. Yeah, yeah. You know, or a vote of 66 of the states. And I don't know. So I'm sure there's somebody listening to this that knows more about civics than I do. But I can assure you it's a constitutional convention or a bunch of people. But we need term limits. I mean, we don't we don't need monarchs and princesses. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's turned yeah, it's turned into more of a kingdom mm-hmm. than a democratic republic, right? Or, democratic. Or, or, it's a republic. Yeah, exactly. All the power is supposed to reside with the that's states. Right. That's right. Or, yeah, it's it's become. You're supposed to be governed by your peers next to you. Yeah, it's not an empire. Not a federal. Yeah. Right. I agree with you 100. percent Yeah, right. we need we need federalism to to regulate interstate commerce Mm -hmm. we need federalism to make sure that the seals have the best airplanes the best bombs yep yep. the best guys the best tactics the best surgical insertion teams to keep us safe so we don't have to fight those fights in the street yep that's it brother and then you know and thank you for your service uh it was an honor david i really appreciate how long were you in 12 years 12 years yep did 12 years active duty i medically retired january 2019 was it a a military injury that got you yeah yeah it was yeah Uh, a combination uh, of injuries so uh yeah but we're lucky to uh i'm blessed to to be able to still uh enjoy a great quality of life heck i just ran 122 miles three days ago so uh, my legs are still good, my heart's still good, my lungs work. And, you, hear, um, you hear that, military? I think y'all y'all discharged him, and we should have checked. <laughs> <laughs> if, if he can if he can do that, I'd let it, I'd let him kill some folks for me, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> David, uh, the, uh, uh, the, I don't know where I, I want to go at, into two different things. Uh, first, I'd like to hear your testimony. I know you've talked about um, how. You know, you 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 give glory to God for the success that you have uh, that you have had in life, and no doubt you've done the work you've put in the work that God's given you. You've done the work and you've done it good. But I would like to hear your testimony, and then I want to go in and just get a few stories from some of the work you've done overseas because I know you come in behind. A, uh, I've at least heard you've came in behind some of these big storms and hurricanes and disasters, and uh, had the opportunity to get some get some stuff back online and and I'm sure help people and uh, in, in big ways. So first, would you share your testimony with us? How how you uh, I, I, how how you've come to believe how you believe and how you've maintained that over the course of your life, man? Yeah, well, that's that's nice that you asked that. Um, you know, I. I I've been to, when I grew up in church, you know, I talked about my father and, and he was a great Christian man, um, a lot better than me. You know, I, I have a few, you know, I'm pretty, um, I get passionate about stuff. So sometimes maybe I, wrong with that. yeah, maybe sometimes I use a word I shouldn't use, but my dad and my father, I've never heard him use a cuss word in his whole life. And, and one of the great attributes that dad has that, that I'm lacking in and I should have it better. Um, and dad for a while drove a truck for me and, you know, he was sole county commissioner in Chattooga County for 16 years. He was an industrial engineer, but he was, then he ended up being a farmer, but, um, and, you know, he did industrial engineering, became a farmer, then did the commissioner stuff and now he's retired. But, you know, he, it was, he's the one that brought me to the Lord. He, he, he taught me that and, and even told me that's the main thing I'm to do, you know, on earth we're put here. Our first purpose is is to get our kids saved. I believe that. I mean, I believe that's our job. And then witness to other people around you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so um, so my dad, I grew up in church the whole time. I did it uh, when we'd go on those youth trips, you know, those guys that come in and go, you know, uh, I don't have a testimony where I've been, you know, chasing crack whores around and drunk and, you know, done this and done all this stuff. And then the – light bulb came on and you know i was a kid in the back goes well it's never too late you know you could go ahead and <laughs> you know maybe screw, run, yeah, screw around a little yeah. while and then come back and straighten <laughs> up you know but no but i i always <laughs> say that you know my my conversion was more like a a dimmer switch instead of a light switch you know my dad just kept me in church was you know uh, showed me what a father should be in the leadership of being a christian man and how to come up and and um and so that's, you know, mine's boring, you know, which is great. 
you know, that, yeah. that we that we live in a thing where, you know, I never have to worry about, you know, seeing anything or being around anything that was bad. You know, my dad didn't drink, never saw, you know, there was never any of that nonsense. You yeah, know? yeah. And so my conversion to Christianity is just by the pure example of, of, a, of a great man yeah. that I, that I still aspire to be and to be that, that father and that leadership to my sons. But, you know, it's just, um, you know, it, it's kind of boring, Yeah, but, but no, it, it's not boring at all. And I, I want to know too, David, how, as, as your success as a businessman con- compounded and, um, you, you you start you start having more things more wealth more possessions more responsibility more, did, has it or or was there ever a time that it was hard to maintain that faith as those material things have really increased throughout your life because you've came you've seen the full spectrum of life i believe i mean you've very, you you came from the farm gathering eggs to now you are very successful. So was there a time where, where that affected your faith? Well, no, I mean, it was actually the other way. I mean, I can remember going home from church and dad telling me the story about a man that became so successful that instead of giving 90% to himself and 10% to the church, he flipped it. And I remember thinking that, you know, one day I want, I want to strive to be able to give back Wow, man. Like, like that. You yeah. Know? So, so it's never really been a challenge, you know, um, I've lost money in business deals uh, because I did what I said and honored what the contract was or honored the spirit of the contract. You know, um, you know, I'm, I'm not very litigious and, you know, I'm 54 now. I've only sued one person that didn't pay me. You know, I've, I've let a lot of it go, but, but part of that comes with um, just treating people the way you want to be treated in the business deal. Yeah. Being honest. I mean, I came and I did Barry. I started with Barry College. Um, it was one of the first big customers I got in Rome, and we still work for them today. And we just did a little job for them, an expansion for them. I charged them, say, like $50,000. And the guy came back to me and he says, You know, the next nearest quote was like seventy eight, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. And I said, Yeah, I know. I said, But y'all have been great to me. I made money at that. That was a fair price. And, and I know that you couldn't get it anywhere else for that, but. You know, I want to do your work next week too. You know, I, yeah. I've always said, you know, I want to do, you know, I'd rather hit, you know, three hard singles to left than to hit a home run on somebody and they never use you again, right? You know, <laughs> just so treat people. I like that, man. Wow. Yeah, yeah treat people like, like you want to do and, it, and it'll come back. You know, yeah. it doesn't always. I mean, there's there's times. I mean, I've tried to do the right thing for people and, and get screwed, you know, but and that happens and – and it'll, and it'll, but it'll usually work back around if you maintain your integrity and do it. But I, I guess if anything, I feel more responsible now just because I have the weight of those 45 guys, that, those 45 families, those people that I work for. I have to make good decisions for everybody now. That's They're right. counting on me for their future, right? Yep. And yep. so that, that's pretty awe inspiring. I mean, I, I used to like it, you know, back in the day. See, people don't realize now, but, you know, money was a little, it was, you couldn't really get lines of credit, but at the bank, you could run your checking account upside down. They won't let you do it today, of course. I mean, I guess some big companies can or whatever, but but they would let us do that. And, you know, I can remember coming in and um, 8.30 Monday morning, bank president would call me and go, David, you know, you're you're upside down 50 grand. I go, yeah, I paid bills on Friday, Thursday last week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a deposit in there. I got this, 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 and coming. <laughs> You know, knowing that I only had like thirty thousand coming in, and I'm already fifty thousand upside down, and we're working on oh, Monday. Smokes, yeah, man. but but you know that that um, man, there's a, there's sort of an adrenaline hustle to that too. You know, you kind of miss that, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's uh, you know, you That's if, cool, if you don't make the right decision, yeah, I mean, there's nothing like that adrenaline, you know, and yeah. then and then it would it would be nothing for me now. I've got it structured better in the office and. And the folks they they manage and they can do all that now and 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 do the billing. But I used to would go in and do the billing. And I'd stay up all night. It's nothing for me to go in and stay up all night. I'd do all the billing and give it to Christy and say, "Here it is. Here's two hundred thousands coming in. I know we owe fifty, but over the next two weeks, this two hundred thousand will come in. Well, then that'd buy you three more months to run. Then you get upside down, 
you'd overdo your checking account. And back then, they didn't even charge you for the checks. I mean, they just let you run it upside down. The bank president call you and do it. But man, there's a hustle to that. You Shoot, know, I bet there is. <laughs> you know, man. I mean, and it makes you it makes you want to go. You know, yeah. But uh, so you know that's fun. Uh, but but as as far as the faith, man, I've just always God got me to here, and um, and I guess. There was a guy one time I worked for. He was worth about a billion dollars, maybe two. And um, he asked me, he says, well, what makes it go or whatever? And I said, well, to be honest, I love what I do so much. If I knew there was somebody like you that would just let me maintain this standard of living, I don't really care about the money. I know people don't believe that, but I really don't care about the money. If I could just get to do what I want to do, it's really not about the money, you know, because what the company is probably worth just kind of by dumb luck. I always knew that I wanted to be in a reoccurring business. I can remember telling my dad. So me and another guy went and started a bank because I decided that I wanted to do everybody's communication. I wanted to be able to, to connect you to the internet at the time. It was communications that really wanted even the internet. And I wanted to trade your money to trade your money. I needed a fed line terminal to get a fed line terminal. I had to have a bank. And then to build that, I needed to have access to the public rights of ways. So me and a me and a buddy of mine, we went and bought a bank charter in Kentucky, and closed the bank down two months before their hundredth anniversary, and moved the charter to Rome, and started a bank. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. We went we went and looked at another oh, wow, bank in Miss. We went to look at another bank in Mississippi. It was a black owned bank, and they picked us up in a limousine. And I was hungry, and we made the limousine take us through the drive through at Wendy's, and the thing broke down in the Wendy's. <laughs> and uh, and so I. Um, uh, I, I actually went in the Wendy's and got a garbage can and filled the radiator up to get us to the, God, <laughs> to God, the meeting. Man. But yeah, so, you know, we've, um, yeah, it, it's never been a problem, you know, that's pretty awesome. And brother. I, and I hope my, and I hope the people hearing this, this is sort of challenging and go, well, I don't think he's witnessed to me good enough. Well, if I have, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> but you know that I don't, I don't think it's a problem. You know, God got me here as he is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a I'm a steward of all the great gifts that he's provided me, and you know if I don't do a good job with them, he'll take them back. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, brother, that's a that is a hard mindset for a lot of human beings to maintain, and it's a blessing to have that mindset. And it's very very uh, just amazing to hear you talk that way, man, and to hear that you are mission driven. Oh, I sat in the meeting. I've sat in meetings before at big corporate tables doing deals and look across the table and say, look, I, you know, I was picking up eggs when I was 15 years old, picking up eggs on the mate and coming home from college and picking up eggs. I know what it's like to be poor and broke. Yeah. And I know I can make a living and I know that I'm going to do this deal and I'm all in on it. You're scared of losing. I ain't scared of nothing. You know, I'll bet everything <laughs> I got to win this deal. You know, and it's hard to lose when you have that mindset. You ain't lying, brother. If they can't take nothing away from you that you can't get it back. There's more millionaires that were millionaires and broke than there are millionaires. Right? That just yeah. made it and made it. All you millionaires making and losing, making and losing and make it. So I figured I made it once. I'll make it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to lose with that mindset, yeah. brother. Gosh, almighty. Blake, I hadn't got like, allowed you to talk the whole podcast. No, man. Sorry about that's that. Fine. Has your, uh, I mean, in, in your business, has your faith ever hindered you, like in any decisions that not maybe a deal that was going and it, you shared your faith and, and hindered the deal or whatever? Or have I, you ever been challenged in that way? Yeah, I've done some, you know, for a little bit, I got trying to do. I have a little production company and we have some equipment and stages and stuff. And, you know, all that business is driven by beer drinking and the way my dad brought me up. I couldn't really, you can't be successful in that if you don't use that component, that side of it. So, uh -huh. you know, I could have probably went and done that, but, but now the liability of that is so high with the other business. I can't put those 45 families at risk because I want to do a yeah. concert. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's hindered it in that way before, but, if, um, I mean, this it, may be that arrogant thing again, but 
man, if you don't want to do business with me because I'm a Christian and I'm telling you I'm a Christian, yeah, I probably don't. I'm probably not the guy. Yep, that's it. I mean, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, you probably need to get another contractor. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, one time, one thing when my dad was running the last time and he got beat by like fifty votes, twenty five people. And people come up to me and say, you know, your dad may just be a little bit too good to be in that job. He may be too Christian. He may be too honest. I go, yeah, that's what you want. That's what you're saying. You want a crook. Yeah. yeah. Or you want somebody that's not honest or you want, or you want to change. And that's fine. You know, like in small town politics, you don't really win. You lose. Right. The guy that's coming in didn't really win. The guy that had it lost it. And so. You know, and people are just looking for a change after that. I think four terms, that might be the record in Chattooga County for holding the share for the commissioner job consecutively. I know there was some three-term folks. I don't know if anybody ever did it four terms consecutively. Maybe, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, but I mean, he did. And and the last time, he kind of didn't bow to some of the, the power folks there. Um, so, I guess it has, but. Well, that you know. goes back to what you said at the beginning is, you didn't just say I'm Christian. You said I'm intentionally Christian. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. And you don't hear that much. But no, that, you don't. That means you're Christian on purpose, and you're Christian <laughs> yeah. for a reason. Yeah. And when those decisions come up, you're intentional. Yeah, I don't want to apologize for being a Christian. Right? Yeah. I, now, but I, but I, but at the same time, it's kind of like when I went to college. You know, God knew what He was doing. He gave me a Lutheran roommate. He's like, "Come on down to preach." The priest is tapping a keg. I'm like, "Dude, what? I'm bad. The priest is doing. He's got a keg." <laughs> you know, and that was sort of interesting. But you know, I needed to see the other side. Yeah. So I don't. I, I can be intentionally Christian, but I got to give you space to do what you want to do. Yeah. I can't beat you to be a Christian. That's right. I can't make you be a Christian. I can just say, "Hey, this worked for me." You know, that's that's what I'm saying, and. and and I'm I'm not apologetic for it. I, I don't. If I didn't get some business because I was a Christian, I I probably didn't need it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you really I didn't like want that, it. Man. They would have been asking you to do things. Yeah, and, against and, what you. Yeah, and I and you know, right. right. That's right. And and you know, and I try to do that with my guys. You know, family and all that stuff. I try to I try to have that same grace that they they do their family stuff and they do their home time and they you know. I, I want to be, yeah. But I think we all ought to be intentionally Christian. I agree, yeah. brother. We ought yeah. to be intentionally patriotic. Yeah. We ought to be, you know, we ought to be proud proud of our country, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, all this nonsense right now, I mean, where they're trying to reparations and punish people and do what, I mean, that's all nonsense. I mean, I can talk to my mom and dad. I can go to Chattooga County right now. I mean, they, you would think it's the most backwoods place there was. But I can't. I could drive around for the next two days talking to twenty thousand people in Chattooga County. There ain't one person up there that hates anybody because their skin's black, yeah, or their skin's white. They don't nobody care. You sorry and you don't want to work. They don't like it. Yeah, you hurting children or you're hurting other people or you're making decisions that affect other people's lives. Yeah, but there's no race problem in America. Yeah, I mean there's no. You know, and and people now, you know, the mainstream media is talking about Christians are stupid. Christians are, well, it, well you're it, dumb because, you know, the, 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 it doesn't line up. I mean, your faith is your faith. How do you even say that? It, it'll, it'll, it'll potentially at some point be, uh, be propagated as a mental illness. Oh, yeah, because you're believing in some deity or something you can't see, so it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. And and then they'll push that to some political narrative to drive their their thing. But yeah. you know, the founders knew what they were doing. Government by the people next to the people. You're gonna be ruled and governed by your people. So if you have a platform that allows everybody to hear you now, this is sort of neat. The podcast has kind of leveled the field on this, right? I mean, you know, you do, you two guys podcast could go viral and ten million people hear it. Yeah. Or Joe Rogan can mention you or somebody or, you know, whatever. And it, and it could get out there, but you know, I think God's in that, but you know, when I think I'm on the right side, when, you know, somebody that has a national platform says that I'm an idiot, you know, yeah, because yeah. then that liberal media, they don't represent us anymore. They don't represent the people that are that you're next to, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of deals. So.
You need to take that, David? No, no, y'all go ahead. All right, roger that. I love that mindset. Uh, when somebody on that side thinks you're an idiot, you're on the right side. Yeah. I, boy, that puts some things into perspective. <laughs> that's a whole new perspective is what that is, yeah. man. Uh, that's solid, brother. Uh, I want to hear about some of these missions that you've been on after these storms and stuff too, David. If that's even what it is. I know Brooke's just given me a, a little bit of insight into that. Um, I just, I just want to hear a, a, about one or, or, or however many, you know, one that maybe was really impactful for you or you felt like you had really the opportunity to, to make a difference, you know, yeah. and, uh, it's interesting to me, um, that you go and, and, and spend your time and, and, uh, and, and help people in that way, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to do that. All right, guys, we're back with y'all. We got David Parker here. David, I had just kind of asked you a question about some of the missions you've done. Um, what, what what would you what, what I mean? Tell me about that. What how is that part of your business or or your mission when you go in? You go in after storms, or, or how does that work? Yeah, so I mentioned that you know during the Olympics we had got to do some of that work, and I met Motorola. Yeah, and so then we started building. Uh, fiber optic networks on military bases with the CIPRNET and force protection radio systems and, and the encrypted radio systems and even built some bulk encryptors to encrypt some T1 stuff for those guys and some fiber stuff. So we, we went all around the world doing that. Well, in meeting the guys from Motorola, if there's a storm, Motorola kind of had this, this team that after a hurricane landed, well, as the hurricanes land and they, they mobilize and go into the storm and, uh, they restore the 911 center and they restore the communications of the, um, like the fire, the police, you know, the radio systems yep. that the police and fire and uh, services use. So my buddy that did that, he, uh, I was sitting there watching on TV, probably like everybody was, you know, so for my, my lifetime, when I wasn't so busy and kind of caught up, Katrina was like the first storm, you know. I mean, that's kind of when, like the Gulf War was the first war where the guys in CNN are like directing the fire, you know, like, hey, shoot one by the airport. That one went a little to the left, you know. So they're embedded. And so when this Katrina storm happened, I was sitting in my living room watching TV, and I called my buddy uh, that worked for Motorola, and I said, hey, Jay. He said, I said, man, are you are you seeing this? And he goes, uh, seeing it? I'm in the middle of it. I'm down here. I'm like, well, dang, what do you, what do you need? He goes, well, I need generators. And, um, and we were, our construction company just started really. And, um, growing up on a farm, I always, I tried to buy pickup trucks and stay out of the big truck business because they were expensive and everybody told me you couldn't really afford them and all that stuff. So, and so I had went out and got, uh, pickup trucks and was trying to do that. Well, I realized that it wasn't safe. So I had just bought a semi truck and a trailer. And uh, kind of growing up my equipment and trying to get a little bit bigger. I probably only had like 10 employees. And um, Katrina, what was that, 2006? Sounds right. Yeah, 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 somewhere in there. So anyway, so, so Jay goes, yeah, man, I'm down here and I need generators. Well, I had just signed a national contract with Neff or Hertz or somebody, uh, a big rental company. And, um, and I said, well, let me see what I can do. You know, he said, and so I called him up and I said, hey, I got four generators for you. And they're at the rental yard beside the airport in Louisiana without knowing I just rented them because he said he needed them. And then, you know, I, that storm had come in, you know, it really didn't hit Louisiana. People don't remember, but Katrina really tore up Mississippi and Texas and Alabama, you know, all down the coast there. It missed Louisiana, but because they hadn't maintained their dock systems, it flooded. Yep. And so, and that's what got all the attention, right? All those good, hard-working country people, like we talking about a country boy can survive in Alabama where whole houses just got obliterated and there wasn't anything left but the concrete slab. Those people didn't make the news. Those people aren't screaming and yelling, writing on the ground in trash, send me a water bottle, yeah. or going into the, you know, into what's the Superdome at that time in yeah. Louisiana, and they're all like, you know, one guy craps in the corner and they go, don't crap in the corner. And they go, oh, this is the corner we crap in. You know, they just destroyed that place. But anyway, the good hard people that got hit, they fixed their stuff. But anyway, he says, I need generators. And I said, okay. So call my nephew guy. He says, I got four. I said, put my name on. And so I called Jay back and he says, uh, 
ah, bull crap, Parker. He says, you, I just left there 20 minutes ago, and they said they didn't have any. I said, well, you working for Motorola. Parker Systems has a nationwide <laughs> account. <laughs> so he went back over there, and sure enough, they gave him them four generators. Well, I started what I called the World Generator Tour. I was buying generators in New Hampshire and Maine, and I was having them truck to Somerville, and then I put them on my trucks and send them down to the to the Gulf Coast <laughs> and started helping him. And, um, I mean, it was just, just like a guy called me. He needed some help. And, and I could help him. And so then I pulled all my guys off, three or four of them. My dad at that time, he was young enough. He was driving a truck for me. I rented another truck. I bought like, I rented like 50 generators. Some of them ran for over a year. I made a bunch of money. <laughs> and uh, I was like, no, that's pretty good right here, you know. Generators was hard to get. Yeah. You know, um, and people want to rent them. So I made a bunch of money. Well, I bought a bunch of generators. I bought like 13 of them, like a million dollars worth. Some line trucks and some now, other these equipment. These must be big generators. Yeah, they're yeah. all 80 kW to 300 kW. Yeah, we ain't talking about the ones you get at Tractor Supply. No, no, no. This like, is, that's this, what this, I was this, thinking. This, this, yeah. These, handle on them. <laughs> no, these are, these are big diesel generators. You know, run like, like a 300 kW would run like 30 houses. You wow. Know, run the whole Man. 911 center, run air conditions, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. 750 watts is a horsepower, so a five-ton air conditioner is 3,500 watts, so just divide it out. So anyway, so um, so I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm good at this, you know, whatever. So, yeah, not a <laughs> not a hurricane didn't hit the coast of America for like the next two years. <laughs> I'm yeah. a redneck sitting there with $2 million worth of generators and nobody wanted to rent them. But, but anyway, so I did that, and then uh, right after that uh, – Galveston, Gustav or Ike, I can't remember the name of the storm. It ran over Galveston. And, and we, so on this one, I went out. The thing that we had trouble getting was fuel generators. So I bought generators so I didn't have to rent them. Couldn't get fuel. So I bought a 10,000 gallon fuel tanker for a compartment like a semi. Yeah. Like you see at a service station. So I could carry our fuel with us. We got food and stuff put together. And then all my guys were in big trucks and carried a couple pickups and had double sleepers. And I took an old bus that I had renovated, and um, and we went in. Well, we got there, and then Motorola's guys, they were all sleeping in their trucks, sleeping on the ground. I couldn't have that, so we'd carry these portable, you know, people call them cows, sail on wheels, or sows, side on wheels, but just these portable radio sites that have antennas, or we'd attach it to the antenna. We carried in the tower crews and electricians, and we did the logistic support. Well, these folks didn't have anywhere to sleep. So then I went back. I'm, I'm still broke, at, you know, at this point. And so I took a 53-foot sleeping truck, a 53-foot refrigerated trailer, and I made it a sleeping trailer to sleep 12 people, like a band bus with 12 bunks down, you know, six bunks down each side, put a whole bunch of water, 660 gallons of water, a big generator on it. And I built this thing in my backyard. Dang. And uh, and then so I started building up some assets and uh, – Got a little bit of retainer for a while for Motorola. They're on again, off again with that. But so then we just started supporting the effort. So now, so now we're up to we carry six or seven semis in. We take um, food. I have a chef. We don't call him a chef because that looks bad, but we call him our cook. Yeah, and uh, he he cooks for us, and we carry fresh and frozen meats, and you know cook for the guys and give them a place to sleep and shower and cool, and you know we take care of them. And so we still do that. Um, I, I'm not much, you know, you guys are all fancy with all the lights and the fancy stuff and the YouTube and all that. So I did take a guy and I called him Drone Boy. I carried him in on a couple of hurricanes. So if you go to Parker Systems on YouTube, there's 31 subscribers. So if y'all really have 10,000 subscribers, y'all just go subscribe to my YouTube and see if I can get above 31, <laughs> 31 users. But there's some videos out there uh, of us going in on the hurricane. They're not long. There's one where we went into Michael. And I think there's one when we went to the one in uh, – Anyway, I've been on every hurricane that hit America above a Cat 3 since Katrina. Gosh, dog, man. Did Sam. you enjoy that? Oh, I love that. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's fun. I mean, you know, it, it, it's problem solving. It's growing up on a farm. It's a little bit electrical. It's the fiber. 
you know, we're supporting the tower guys, you know, we're climbing towers that maybe we have to cut off with the demo saw and get them out of the way. And then the tower guys climb it. We get it safe. We go and get, you know, we used a concrete truck one time and stood it straight up and made an antenna. Yet. And then Louisiana, we put them <laughs> on top of bridges. You know, the noise floor goes down because the hurricane turns off all the energy. So, you know, everybody's little router at 4.9 megahertz or 2.4 gigs. And then all the 800 cell phone, all that stuff goes away. So the noise floor goes to zero because there's no energy. And then when we turn our radio systems back on, they talk real good. And, mm. you know, we get out and then we optimize them. And we got some of the sharpest folks with Motorola that go in that um, optimize the radio systems. And we put them back on the air. And the towers themselves, the structures are designed for 110, 150 mile an hour winds. They typically stay. The buildings are designed for that. But the wave guides and antennas, they all blow off at about 100 miles an hour. You just can't attach that stuff that's cantilevered off of the structure. Yeah. The line sets blow off and all that. So we carry in all that stuff and turn those radio systems back on. Dang it, man. Yeah. I what, mean, what do you not do? <laughs> that's what I was sitting here thinking. He just, I mean, you got a bank. You you can you could stand up internet. You you go in here to does that? I mean, this is unbelievable, yeah. man. It ain't. It's not hard. It's just that we're not afraid. We're just not afraid. We, we just yeah. We just try it. You know. We grew up on a farm. When the tractor broke, we didn't get to load it up and take it to the shop and sit there and wait for them to fix it. Dad's like, "There's a toolbox. Figure out what's wrong." Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we didn't, we couldn't work on injectors and injector pump, but man, I grew up poor. I mean, when I went to college, first year of college, I didn't even have a car. Dad carried me down there and dropped me off in the middle of Atlanta. And then, um, I don't know if y'all remember the diesel Oldsmobile. They made a, uh, they took that real good 350 motor gas motor and made it a diesel motor, which was a disaster. And, you know, you could take a car that would be worth used car. Ten thousand dollars. If it had a diesel engine in it, it wouldn't bring but two thousand dollars. Well, most of the people that put them diesel motors in the cars, they're putting them in those ninety eights and those eighty eights, all tricked out with every button and thing. Well, my dad went to the auction and he managed to find me a diesel Oldsmobile that they paid extra to have no options. I'm talking about this thing had a AM FM radio and air, and you rolled the windows down by hand, uh-huh. and it was a four door car. And you know, they, the model line was made off kind of like a van is today. You know, it looks like the inside of the truck model that's two years old that they don't have, they don't make anymore. So I had this family four door car diesel. I put three injector pumps on it myself on the weekend. I did two water pumps and changed the head gaskets three times <laughs> and got that old car to go 200,000 miles, you know, <laughs> but it was worth 2,200 bucks. I mean, I grew up poor. I mean, you just had to do it. But, but you those, become innovative. But those life yeah. lessons of working on the farm, you know, now we've got directional boring machines and trend. Well, you saw the kind of stuff we yeah. have. But dad would be like, hey, cows over there need some water. Take a subsoiler, and that's just like a one shank plow that's about, you know, going to ground about 30 inches. Make you a couple of passes, get y'all a pick, and dig that water line in. I'm like, dad, they, we can rent a trencher. Yeah, I got two boys. We'll just rent them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we had to. We grew up working. We need to get your dad on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, one day, you man. should. I mean, that'd be that'd be pretty epic to hear some of his stories. He sounds like an amazing man. Yeah, and I mean, and, and he 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 was good. He had an old he had an old truck that he had T pipes on where he could unscrew two inch things so he go drag race it. <laughs> He had three okay, three carburetors on an old Ford truck, but it had to be his daily, his working ah. truck, you know. But he still drag raced it on the street. You know, it's a different time, you know, but yeah. still. Yeah. But, no, we grew up. And so when we do those hurricanes, we're good at that because we know how to rotate the power. We can get the generators in. We know a little bit about plumbing, electrical, air conditioning. We can turn the 911 centers on. I can get the logistics. We bring the food, the supplies. You know, now we roll in with skid loaders and – whatever we need to open the path. I mean, and we're in the hurricane. If you look at those videos, you'll see, I always say Motorola ain't happy unless we get wet. We are literally seeing where the storm hits and we deploy on the weak side of it, get in behind it. We usually get rained on winds usually down to about 50 miles an hour. And then we're back in there, you know, but we have to, if you get in there and you turn those 911 centers back on and you get the communications up and the 911 centers not running cards or manually, and they're like calling in just, you might save one life. You might save 10 lives. Yeah. You know, Hey, the water's up over here, this or this, and now you get the people. 
if you're having if there's no phones the cell phones are down usually you know sometimes they stay up but you know we're ju- we're literally usually turning it on you know into nothing you know and that's what we do and then we're having to deal with roads washed out yep. i mean the whole thing you know yeah so it's just like um you know it's 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 exciting it's fun but you know there's just not a lot of people that have all those skill sets and then i have this amazing crew of guys that work out and work with this equipment and know how to drive big trucks and know all that part of it. And, and so we can kind of, and most of our customers understand that if during hurricane season, we pull off for two weeks and I take 10 or 15 highly trained technicians that are either super proficient in fiber optic and splicing and running equipment and driving trucks and electrical and techs with all these skill sets. And we pull them off and we can go in there, stay eight or 10 days and get everything back on. Yeah. Yeah. We did the same thing in Haiti, you know, when the earthquake hit Haiti. Mm-hmm. And we were in there um, uh, 31 hours after it was in. And obviously, I can't carry any trucks and logistics that I do, but it was it was nice to get asked to go on that one because a Motorola guy called me and said, I said, well, Jay, you know, I can't take – I don't have any trucks. I'm not taking generators. We're not taking anything. So he says, yeah, but you do all of our logistics and – and so I did medical and security for the, that team. We hired some folks that went in, but you know, we <clears throat> Motorola being corporate, maybe they can't carry the right equipment that a contractor can. Yeah, yeah. And and so we bring we brought those resources and we went in and took care of that. And in 38 hours, we stood up a 12 channel trunking system over Port au Prince and had them back on the air. Yeah. They wanted your innovation. That's what they wanted. Yeah. Well, they wanted your ability to solve problems. Right. And and yeah. it, and and that was nice to do it. And 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 he, and he called me. and He said, "You know, I can pay you what we normally pay you. I can't pay you what it's worth." And I was like, oh, "Doesn't matter." I said, "You know, the way I looked at it was if there was a dad in Puerto Rico or in Haiti or another country or wherever, and and something happened to our families here." And somebody could come and it would make life easier and get back to normal that much quicker for that family. And God's given you the ability to do that. How can mm. you say no? Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's why I went. That's yeah. awesome, brother. Well, David, uh, I mean, you've reached uh, a very uh, high pinnacle. What, what's next for you, man? I mean, what what are you looking forward to? What are you looking for? I mean, is it is it now? Are you just at a place where you want to maintain, or or how does that look for you? Because I could only imagine you don't want to get bored. You don't seem like the type of person that wants to get bored, and you got enough right now to keep you busy. But yeah. is there something that you're looking to? I like I like what I what I do, obviously. And then you know, my I mentioned <laughs> that my two boys wanted to come back, and um, you know, if, if they want to if they want to carry on, I'm gonna be there to support them. Yeah. And, and do what I want to do. I mean, maybe do what I do a little bit bigger. I mean, I've had some offers to purchase a company, which was numbers that are fantastic of anything I would have ever dreamed that I would have achieved in my life, you know. But um, the main thing is, is to, um, you know, like I like I mentioned before, not to be cliche, but, you know, my two boys love the Lord. So, you know, I met that obligation that yeah. God gave you. And then it's to go out and support your community and tell other people about Christ. You know, that's the next the next goal. And then to be responsible and a good steward of the gifts that God gave you. I mean, there's, you know, there's a story in the Bible where, you know, God gave different level of gifts to different people and they managed them differently and he yep. rewarded them based on how they managed what he gave them. That's it. And uh, as long as he keep giving me stuff, I'm going to try to keep, managing it the way he would have me manage it and if we can grow and specialize and you know get better at what we do or you know do a better job you know in in the world you can usually there's three things you can be faster to market you can be better to market or you can be the best value you and you can pick two of those and you can never be all three and every now and then because at&t and windstream suck so bad we can be all three Mm. We can get there faster than they can get there. We can deliver a better product than they deliver, and we can deliver it at a cheaper price. Yep. That's unusual. It's just because they're so corporately monolithic and yep. and so big. But, you know, most of the time you can't do that. But, you know, as long as we can continue to do that, um, 
you know, we're seeing the market change a little bit, you know, internet, the price to internet goes to zero and then the transport, you know, it continues to go down based on bandwidth and, and transport. But at some point we reach a level where like a human being can consume about 40 megs of data. You know, I've seen different studies, but that that's kind of my, what I think it is. You know, if you look at one, like a 4k video stream, now you can't see any better than that, right? You're, yeah. The the 4K picture has got more information in it than we can assimilate. The sound, 20 to 20 hertz. You know, I can't hear past probably 13K or 10K now, maybe not even 7. You can hear the bass down to 20 and feel it. And then if I shake you and every stimulus, 40 megs. So once we get to 100 megs or a gig, 1,000 megs, to you, you, you can't assimilate that. And if yeah. the delivery methodology is – is even sloppy, you know, you, you know, you reach that. So when, when you get to that level and that speed, there's really nothing else. So now we're going to start talking about latency and people will start talking about not how fast your internet is. You know, when these devices came out, they talked about the dot pitch and the resolution of the screen today. We don't care about the screen yeah, because we know the screen's better than we can see. <laughs> the screen's better than anybody can see. Wow. So we don't talk about the screen. No yeah. More. We, and we don't talk about all the features, you know, or now we just talk about the things that matter, the memory and the latency. And, and so the internet will get like that. We won't care about how fast it is. You just care about the latency. And so that's one thing our network does is we're five milliseconds to Google in Atlanta or to, to the network, you know, Windstream and AT&T because they have to route their cir- circuits and we handle it as one ethernet segment and region it that way. It's faster. But AT and T does it, and they do routers because of the legacy of their system. So they're forty to fifty milliseconds. So people start talking about latency. So we're already ahead of that game. Yeah, we you know we've always had the speed and we've always had the latency. So when people realize that it's the quality, it's sort of like what we talked about in the beginning with the satellite. People don't like satellite internet because of the latency. That's what kills it. Yeah, the speed can be there, and it can be you know streamed everywhere, and Elon Musk will win eventually because you know we, we can go over this real quick everybody goes well what about what's he call it something net his elon's project he's called something I've, I've heard about it i don't know i ha- obviously it's above my head david yeah, yeah, but, I know yeah. but anyway right so he so, so he has a bunch of satellites at that low orbit he hasn't really got this worked out he still needs terrestrial based fiber to shoot the link up to the satellite and it comes down and it has to hand off well, then he's also come up with this way that this laser, you know, fiber is shot with a laser. And at the end of the day, it just blinks. It's a protocol. And, and everybody goes, well, that's all. Oh, it's complicated. No, it's not. A protocol is nothing more than like when we were kids and we'd stay out late of the evening. If dinner was ready, mom would say, turn the light on on the back porch. We could see that a long way away. Mm-hmm. And we knew that if the light was on, dinner was ready. Well, that's a protocol. You know, you could have another protocol that if the light goes on and then you turn a red light on, then you turn the white light off, that means bring tea. Mm-hmm. If you turn the white light on, dinner's ready, and you turn the green light on, we need ice. That's a protocol, and that's yeah. what that's all the internet does. It just does it really, really fast. Yeah. And so what Elon's figured out is that the speed of light propagating through a media, say glass, is this fast. And I'm going to mess up the numbers, but, you know, a few years ago – they built an undersea cable from Miami to the Caribbean and ended up in Europe. And then the people that were trading money between the European market and the American market said, well, we need to get there as fast as we can. And so they built a dedicated cable using the great circle of the earth to be straight and save five milliseconds. And let's just say that times 40 milliseconds, the propagation to get to Europe. Elon has got the network that goes up and he's going to have a laser a steerable laser array on each of the satellites that when it goes up, say in New York, it steers a laser through like three of his satellites through this great arc. And then it goes down in Europe. Well, laser light through a vacuum is three or four times faster than it is through a media. So Elon's going to get there 10 milliseconds faster than any terrestrial based way, even though he's going farther, he's going up 300 miles across 300 miles and then down. down. Yeah. And so he'll win there. When he gets that steerable laser array worked out that doesn't, you know, it steers optically with using switching transistors and, you know, like a steerable satellite array. 
when he gets that fixed and working, I don't think that's working yet. He doesn't have enough satellites. He'll win because you'll have to buy it from him because all the people in Europe will beat to death the people that are trading on the other way. Yeah. And then he'll win with like boats in the ocean and people in Africa and, you know, mm-hmm. people where there's no infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And eventually it'll it'll get there, but you're still going to need the terrestrial base fiber. You're still going to need the the reliability and the latency. So I'm not too worried about that. So um, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and, and we, we try to do a little better with the way we do. I mean, we started out taking one semi-truck with fuel. Now we take seven. I mean, <clears throat> as long as as long as there's a need, we'll just keep doing what yeah. we do. You know? Do you think you'll ever stop? I hope not. No plans for retirement. I mean, what am I? <laughs> what, what what's what's more fun than what I do? I, I can tell, man. You are so passionate about yep. this, and that's that's what makes it so cool, man. Like I don't know any. You've taught me so much in this conversation that I, I my my I would have never tried to grasp it, but you have a very unique way of explaining complex things in country boy logic yep. <laughs> to where I can understand. Okay, this is all right. Now this is starting to make a little sense mm-hmm. to me right very that's a that's a tremendous gift that you have but uh but just the fact that you're so passionate about it man i could sit and listen to you talk for hours because you love what you do and uh and it is a a very necessary and valuable service man i'm gonna tell you i mean what you did at our house just mind-boggling yeah it's just mind-boggling don't get carried away my grandfather he he was he was a good dude he told me he says don't get too excited. The graveyard's full of indispensable people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. So, yeah. It keeps rolling on, don't yeah, it? Yeah, it don't, it don't matter. Well, I figured out running the internet is just a front for what David really does. It got all kind of other stuff. Yeah, which is everything. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Man, and y'all, and see, y'all are being too nice. At the end of the day, I'm a fancy plumber. All we do is dig a hole in the ground and put a piece of duct in it, and then instead of running water through it, we blow a piece of fiber through it. Huh. I mean, that's all we do. Wow, man. I mean, at the end of the day, huh. I mean, we're plumbers. I mean, we're digging in the dirt. I mean, we got some cool toys. Yeah. But, you know, we're digging in the dirt, and then we blow a fiber cable. That's a pretty neat thing, too. We can blow a fiber cable 10,000 feet through a piece of duct. Thank Two miles. Somebody, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can put it on a pole and you can put it in the ground. We like to put it in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll put it on a pole. I mean, we're doing some out here. We got a joint build with North Georgia, so we're building some fiber with them and, you know, making making our rings and making our, our paths redundant. I mean, we're we're redundant in Atlanta Chattanooga now. You know, we go from Chattanooga back down through Bremen, pick up I twenty corridor and go into Atlanta. And then we kind of exploit the I seventy five corridor and come back up, go through Chatsworth, and end up, you know, through Dalton, go back to Chattanooga and come back around. So we have yeah. a ring, you know. So if something happens on part of the ring, you, you survive. And then we've also built now, you know, more pieces and paths through to get to other customers. That's awesome, brother. Yeah. So we got you. We got David on YouTube. What what was Parker Fiber? Well, the, the Parker Systems. Parker Systems on yeah. YouTube. Is there anywhere else people can find you or follow you, man? Yeah, I'm not a I'm not much on that whole, you know. You I've mean got, you don't have your Instagram page up? Well, I got my kids did an Instagram for the company, and, you know, there's a lot of big trucks, you know. But um, we don't um, – I'm, I'm not a social – I don't have a Facebook account. Yeah. I don't have an – you know, the, the company has – I guess the company has one. But I don't, I don't believe in that stuff. I don't um, – you know, I've got everything turned on. You know, I have to have a phone, but I've got everything I can turned off on it, and they they're still tracking me around. I'm convinced, and so I don't um, I don't like that part of it. I don't like that if I if I go on Facebook, I've never been. I don't like it. There there doesn't need to be an algorithm that knows more about me than I know about myself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not. I mean, you know, it's it's funny that I'm yelling at about YouTube and all that, and I actually hate the whole concept of it. You know, well, I hate the tracking. Yeah, where they're watching what people are watching, and then they tie that to what they're doing on their Facebook, and they're building profiles of what people are doing. It's it's incredibly accurate because, you know, this thing will still come up and tell me how many minutes I've been, you know, texting or talking on the yeah. phone, or how many times the screen's on, and I'm looking at it. And uh, just think if 
what they know about folks, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not much on it. So I don't have any Facebook. I don't have any Instagram. You with, know. Well, with your with your under with 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 the level of understanding that you have of technology, speaking of that, are there things that people can implement in order to be more secure or or lessen um the ability of big tech to track them. I mean, yeah, I, you know, you can go in and there's probably people don't realize there's probably 30 settings on the phone that default on and they do it in such a way and they say it, they say it wrong. So they say, uh, enable tracking, like do not en enable tracking on me. And the answer you think would be yes, but that means enable it. You know, mm -hmm. so you have yeah. to really read and pay attention and everything defaults to them tracking you. You know, I don't need it. Every time I pull up at the mall, they tell me there's a, there's a sale on cookies at Chick-fil-A. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I'm fat enough. But, <laughs> you know, but I also don't need it to, you know, because I went to three websites about Donald Trump, MasterCard sending my information to the government, you know, doing that. Or I don't, I, you know, my phone doesn't need to know that it's time for me to go home. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, I just, and, mm -hmm. and the Facebook tracking and your, your likes and the things you do, you know, if, um, you know, we're worried about going into an event or something and, and, you know, like when some of the, you know, the rioting and all that stuff happened around our data centers and I go and research what Antifa's doing so that I know that they've got somebody that they're going to insert, you know, to try to get the local people that are probably protesting for something positive. And then they send the Antifa guys in there to get that bunch stirred up. And I, and I looked that up. I don't need them sending me that like I'm an Antifa, you know, that's right. Supporter. Mm -hmm. But you know, that happens. So, you know, I, yeah. I, I keep all that stuff turned off. I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I got 800 number, 808 Parker. If you need me call 808 Parker. And, um, <laughs> and, and if you can, if you can get Kathy to call you back. So I have this thing, I give Kathy $50 a week and she gets to keep it. But if she gets uh salesman calls through, I take $10 back for everyone that gets through. No kidding, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> cause people are just like, Oh, me and Dave went to school together, blah, blah, blah. And she'll be like, you know, and it, I, I, well, I, I was about to say what my code is, but I guess if y'all really have 10,000 people and we're going to be so successful, this thing goes completely viral. I viral. I wouldn't want to give my code away. Yeah. Yeah. Don't give your code <laughs> away, man. No, no, no. You know what I'm saying? But uh, <laughs> It's all good. you know, but no, I don't, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a big, so the only reason I mentioned the YouTube was, um, if you wanted to see what we did on yeah, the hundred there's a video man. you can kind of see how, how we're moving in the trucks and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go check that out. As a matter of fact, and uh, well, brother, it's been an honor to to get to sit down here and talk to you. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while. Uh, like I say, I'll say it again. You taught me a lot in this conversation, and your passion for what you've been called to do really shines through. I want to thank you personally for being such a wonderful steward of what God has given you, mm -hmm. uh, and I want to thank you for having that boldness and courage to share your faith. Um, gosh, no, we need more men, intelligent men to, uh, share that aspect of themselves because, uh, you know, you can be intelligent and be a Christian. Um, yeah. actually, uh, we, we've even heard Justin Fulcher said one time as technology, um, and as our understanding of the universe increases, it actually points us, uh, to God and a, a, um, a creator right and yeah. uh you know I, I just i love hearing highly intelligent people talk about their faith in yeah. god because it, it it really means a lot to me i, I appreciate it david well, when are them when are them highly intelligent people showing up yeah, come on <laughs> man come on <laughs> well I, I appreciate you guys having me and uh thank you for what you do and and you know and like you said though i wish more people would say you know say their faith and not be afraid of you know I can't be canceled because I'm not on any social media. That's right. So, you know, and, and who cares if you're canceled? I mean, be for God if you're for God. Be for our country if you're for our country. You know, be be for the military. Be for the police. I mean, I, I think 95% of the country is for the police. I think these crazy people that have the microphone mm -hmm. 
is what's creating the problem. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and, the, and everybody's going to be scared of 5% of the people that have the microphone. Cause I promise you, if it gets bad, a seal is going to make it a country boy. Like you is going to make it. Yeah. You know, who was it? Uh, Hank Williams, Jr. Country boy can't survive. All you flag waving liberal people that want to have a problem with me driving a gasoline car. When it all hits the fan and your, your heat don't work and your air don't work and your grocery store don't work, you know, where does mm-hmm. the meat come from? I don't know where you get yours from. I get mine from the grocery store. You know, then people get in line behind us mm-hmm. when it gets ugly. Yeah, we got we got a couple million pounds on the hoof right out here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll go hunt cow. That's it, brother. <laughs> It'll be easy. But, yeah, I'd, I'd like to encourage folks to be, you know, be, be about their faith, be about their Christianity, be about – their belief in the system and, you know, and, and try to put people, you know, in those congressional seats and in those positions of political importance that have your faith system and your belief mm-hmm. system and they aren't afraid to say it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, we're, we're supposed to be a Republic, a representative Republic of a democracy. Then they're supposed to represent us. I don't think they do. They represent their checkbook and them getting more power and, making government bigger that ain't the way it's supposed to be agree our government our government when you say government you all think state of georgia yep yep. your your community you shouldn't think federal government yep federal government should regulate trade and keep us safe on the world stage yep and then everything else ought to be your local government i mean your our schools ought to be by our people Uh, you know our you know it ought to be a consensus of what our communities want not what somebody in washington wants well buddy we have screwed that up yeah <laughs> we have screwed that up yeah i mean i'll, I'll give it a amen that's the reality of the way it, it should operate yeah i couldn't say it any better myself there's nothing that i can add or take away from that statement you just made yeah. um you know uh, uh, you know I, I, I i'm afraid we're seeing the the collapse of an empire and it will fix itself yeah. It will fix itself. Capitalism has a way of doing it. Oh, yeah. 100%, brother. David, yeah. if you've got anything to do today, you better stop talking about that or old Chad <laughs> liable to run loose right here. Look, oh, man, yeah. That's my handler right there. <laughs> I feel like I should thank David for cutting our power back on for some reason because <laughs> now that I've talked to him for a while, I think he might have had something to do with it. Oh, he <laughs> made a phone call. I texted him. I said, hey, man, our power's out. Um, We'll give it till 12. And he said, I tell you what, I got one more meeting. I'll plan on being there at one thirty. If it's not on at one, then we'll cancel it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then the power comes on about fifteen minutes later, and the podcast is happening. So I, I don't know. Maybe he made a. Oh yeah. He, he made a high up call for us. So appreciate <laughs> well, that, David. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I honestly didn't make a high up call. I might, I might just have some information that you didn't know about because when you when you build fiber optic cables on existing power poles. There's a, a project called Make Ready where you have to get, like, if the pole's not tall enough because other people's added communications or something, you got to do some Make Ready. Well, I don't know if y'all have noticed out on 27, mm-hmm. they're doing Make Ready. And I might have known why your power was off. <laughs> <laughs> so I might have had a little inside information. I might have been the reason it was off. <laughs> but, uh, That's but, so cool. Yeah, but, yeah, it's just by coincidence. And I knew that if you just buy you a minute that, uh, that it'd be back. And yeah. They, they were changing out a pole, so I knew that's why they had y'all for just a minute. But, yeah, that's all good. But, yeah, the other night, the the local EMC, and that's another great thing about America. One of the greatest things, and I'll, I'll say this and then we'll get off of it. The REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, is probably the most successful program that the federal government ever put in place. So they, it was put in place so that when the cities had light bulbs or a light, you know, and you could you could do something, run a washing machine, start an industry, do whatever. The the rule, the government, federal government said, hey, we need to get power out to these small farms. You know, that's the lifeblood of America, the small business, the small family farm. That's why our country is so successful is because these people went out and started their own farm, their own family, had a bunch of kids, and they did it, and they became their own industry. Yep. And, and they needed power to do that. They needed washing machines and gins and mills. And, and then that got them into welders. And the Industrial Revolution started by the electrification of the small farm. And the REA did that by taking money and putting out there. The Internet needs to be the same way for these communities because it's just as important. And it allows 
you guys run an internet from whoever into your business in the middle of y'all. I mean, y'all a little closer than the middle of nowhere than I live and you live, but yeah. this house here is still way out. But I mean, you guys have, you know, sitting in this room, more technology that landed three shuttles and, you know, two things on the moon and y'all have great audio gear, video gear. You can do whatever. And, and the quality of the audio and the video production that you can do with this consumer, um, you know, pr pro consumer gear rivals what is happening at a, a studio in a major market five years ago. Yeah. Better than 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and you guys can do that yourselves, but you can only do it because the internet's here. Right. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. You have to be somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I can right. never, well, it would be impossible yeah. to do it without the internet. So, so the government, one of the good things I'm never for government programs, but the REA model could be used with these EMCs and these other folks to extrapolate that same model to get the internet to these guys, because then you're going to push the opportunity for small businesses, whether it be as, obvious as a podcast and a video thing to somebody, you know, figuring out the code to do this better or to take an Arduino and make this or to make that and create those businesses and, and serve that need. That internet is going to be as valuable as that power. hundred percent. And we should treat it that way. And we're not, we're talking about infrastructure being home care and we're talking about infrastructure being critical race theory and nonsense. I mean, we need to, we need to get the folks what they need. Yeah. And, and, they, and they want that. I mean, the polling is all turned back around on them and they're, they're flipping around, but yeah, we, we need the REA, the rural electrification, that model just needs to be applied. That was one thing. That's one federal program that worked. And if you'd apply that to the, to the internet and get into the delivery where you get the latency and the high speed out to the consumer, we don't do residential internet. We only are serving, you know, businesses, uh, it's just a economic factor of where we are. I mm -hmm. mean, I can't teach, you know, Lord, I think about my mom and dad that's on the internet. I can't have them calling me doing the internet cause they do. But imagine if I had a hundred of my mom and dad going, I can't print and I can't get Susie's graduation yeah. picture to come up on Facebook. I mean, we can't do that. Yeah. We have enough trouble when we got the professional folks that are supposed to be running like a whole bank or something and they can't figure it out yeah yeah i can't be teaching my mom and dad how to print <laughs> yeah i get it yeah. yeah but anyway but that but that's what that's why america was so successful is you know we had a million businesses that had three employees we didn't have three employees that had a million we didn't have three businesses that had a million a million employees, employees. that's right yep yeah, that's why that's why we're successful man that's why our country's successful. that's the truth brother and and you know even with everything that's happening I'll take boys like you and him. I'll go to the fight with you. And, you know, just like sitting in that boardroom telling that guy, I've been poor before and I can be poor again. And I ain't it. afraid. I can get back up, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, in you China. You fired and, me up, man. Yeah, well, in China and all them other people, they're sitting there and they're and they're thinking, well, you know, they, they're getting us. You know, they're buying our country away from us. Yeah. They're buying the businesses away from us, you know. Google's done sold us out. Amazon's done sold us out. And it's just a business deal for them. It's at 10, 90%. It's easy. But, you know, I'll, I'll still take, I've been to Korea. I've been to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a foot taller than them people. I know I can take on like five of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> you know, and if I take three or four of them with me that I've kind of, you know, that's worked beside me and done a little training with us, nothing to what you've done. But I bet five of me could take 50 of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, my five guys, well, I'll, put, I'll go, you know, and, that, and that's why America's great. You know, we don't need to take that away. I can't say, I can't, again, I can't add nothing or take yeah. away from that. That's perfectly put. Yeah. And that is why this nation has become so great in such a short amount of time. Yeah, in history. Look yeah. at what we've accomplished in 300 years. It's, it, it's, un, it's unsurpassed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I went to Kenya one time, and I was over there looking at a building, a fiber cable from Mumbai up to, to the sea, and we was, we was there and we was looking, and I was going to bring two D9 plow trains in, and they, they was an actuary was there was like, well, we'll just dig it by hand. And I'm like, okay. And no, he was serious, like 3,000, 4,000 people. And he goes, we're going to kill 30 people. And I'm like, Phew. and so I start talking about the plow train and bringing equipment. He's like, well, hold up, David, what are you talking about? I said, well, if we're going to kill 30 people, that's not an option. Ah, we got plenty of people. 
killing 30 people ain't nothing. Well, that's actually low. We figured we'd kill a few more. I mean, and that's that was their mindset. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I looked around there, and I go, you know, y'all got the wheel and the fire like 3,000 years before us, and y'all still stuck at the wheel and the fire. They are. I mean, they, they still have the back end out of a 57 Chevy making a cart that two guys is pushing. I mean, you know, what happened in America? What happened in America is – a country boy can survive. That's it, man. You know, they, you know, we, we got a light bulb out there and a motor and them guys engineered and MacGyvered and built and fixed mm. and got equipment. And, you know, the Vermeer drilling machine, directional boring machine comes from a guy that built a plow in Iowa. You know, I mean, that's why America's that's great. That's it, brother. You know, the, the folks had, they've had the wheel in the fire for 3,000 years. They still have the wheel in the fire. Yeah. I mean, we got a gum F-15 that can fly three times the speed of yeah, sound yeah. and hit a thing the size of this house while zipping by at 2,000 miles an hour, you know? And they can't get their bus to quit smoking when it pulls up to the curb. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that ain't true. Yep. I've been all over that continent, man, and, and I... And I hear what you're saying. They, they they weren't concerned about killing 30 people digging a ditch and could care and less. There's there's no value on human life over there. No. None at all. Depends on which and, human life. Well, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. And yeah. you know, it's uh, I, I have to believe too. You know, our nation was uh, founded on biblical principles, and yeah. uh, and y- you just can't dispute it. You just you just can't dispute it. Was it, a, it was an excellent model and it worked prior. That's it right. right. That's right. You got anything, Blake? No, just just thanks for coming on and being willing to share everything yeah. that you have, and uh, I just appreciate it. Yeah, I'm gonna go listen to a podcast now. I didn't know about you guys. There you go. I rolled in here. And- now you better be ready, David. You better be ready. We we bring we, we bring some heat on this joke. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. This Thank is the you. three of seven podcast. Enough said.